Guys, let's uh, have a discussion about Social Security mm -hmm. and maybe our entitlement programs in general, mm -hmm. but let's narrow in a, a specifically on Social Security because this is a question that I'm getting a lot from individuals in the office that they're really concerned. Mm -hmm. There's information in the news, there's reports that you can read where some people are claiming uh, you know, Social Security is going to go away mm -hmm. or it's yeah. going to be taken away from us. I think what's causing some of those concerns is the fact that there's an issue, yeah. there's a problem. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the unfunded liabilities between Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid is projected by some to be as high as like $150 trillion, wow. right? With the baby boomers that are now retiring and starting to draw from the program. Mm -hmm. Obviously, we have individuals that are living longer, so mm -hmm. life expectancy is causing some problems. So what I want to try and do is give our viewers some information about Social Security. Mm -hmm and then maybe kind of set the record straight, maybe alleviate some concerns, mm -hmm. uh, but then also point out some areas where maybe it's legitimate to have some concerns about it as well. So mm -hmm. let me start out by asking you guys some questions. Okay, I'm kind of curious. Are you ready for this? Now, I did not feed you the questions already, yeah. right? <laughs> so first time you're hearing them. So does anybody know here between the two of you uh, what year Social Security was first established? Because we went a very long time as a country without the program mm -hmm. at all. I know it, but I'm going to let you. I'm going to let you answer this one, Jordan. 1942. 1940. It's close. It's actually 1935. Okay. So what this was is this was part of FDR's New Deal mm -hmm. uh, that uh, some individuals needed just a little bit of kind of a social safety net. Mm -hmm. So back in 1935, do you guys, either one of you, know how many workers were paying into Social Security for every one person that was drawing money out of it? Um, how many were paying in for every one person actually drawing out of it? Twenty-five. Twenty-five. Um, I'll say ten. Okay, 10, 25. Mm -hmm. The actual number was 42 to 1. So you had 42 wow. individuals working, paying into the program for every one person that was taking money out. Now, you had to be 65 years old to even start to draw it. Okay. And what was the average life expectancy in 1935? <laughs> you, had be, you had to be 65 to get it. What was the average life expectancy? 65. <laughs> 65? What do you think, Jordan? 68. 68? Okay. It's actually 62. You're kidding me. No. No. Wow. So okay. uh, the average life expectancy was 62. You had to be 65 to even get it. Now, if you did start drawing it, how long did you draw on it for, on average before passing away? Oh, back, wow. in, back in the 30s, how long did you draw on it before passing away? Four or five years? Uh, I would say 18 months. Okay. Yeah. Uh, 18 months is close. It's actually two years. Okay. Okay. So if we take a look at Social Security, when it was started, was it solvent? Was it in good shape? Well, it was great shape. Yeah, great yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, absolutely no problems at all when they started the program. Now, obviously, over time, some things happened mm -hmm. yeah. that caused the program to evolve. I think probably the biggest issue was shortly after Social Security was started, we, we fought a world war, and then we came home, and we started doing what at a rate we'd never done before? What did we start doing? Making babies. Making babies, right? <laughs> so we had the, the baby boom, greatest baby boom we've ever seen, right, in our nation's history. Now, did the baby boomers have less children than their parents? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. There's, mm -hmm. a, there's about a 27 million mm -hmm. gap. So baby boomers had 27 million fewer mm -hmm. children than what their parents had had. So if we fast forward to today, uh, Social Security is in a little different situation, right? Mm -hmm. So today, how many people are paying in for every one person that's drawing money out? I think it's 2.1. I read this in a, in a magazine. Yes, yeah. it's, it's called. Okay, so today we have three. Oh, wow. Paying okay. in for every one person taken out. Now, in 10 years, yeah. mm -hmm. the number is projected to fall to 2 to 1. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so it started out originally 42 to 1, mm -hmm. and within 10 years, it's going to be just 2 to 1. Now, you can draw Social Security today mm -hmm. as early as 62. Yeah. So we actually made it easier mm -hmm. to get. <laughs> yeah. It made it more available for more people. We added things like disability and things like that. Mm -hmm. So if someone starts to draw on Social Security at age 62, mm -hmm. do you know how long they will draw on it on average before passing away? Gosh, I don't know. 20. It used to be two years. What is it today? How long will they live on average? 15, 20 years? Yeah, 20 years. It's 23 years. Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay. And every five to 10 years, obviously, that gets longer, mm -hmm. Yeah. right? So obviously today, we've got a little bit of an issue, mm -hmm. right? It's not in the same shape as yeah. it was in the past. And unfortunately, with baby boomers living longer and longer, that's a great thing, but it's really bad for Social Security mm -hmm. and Medicare mm -hmm. in particular. Uh, there's an individual by the name of David Walker, mm -hmm. who's the former Comptroller General of the United States under President Bush and President Clinton. Mm -hmm. And he actually says that the problems with Medicare are actually five times worse than the problems that we have with Social Security. Mm -hmm. so, so that's a little bit of the history and where we are now. Now, if we take a look at proposed changes to Social Security mm -hmm. and kind of what we think will happen moving forward, you know, obviously, nobody has a crystal ball, 
But I think one of the things that we've done as a country is we've pretty much said we're not going to do away with this benefit, right? right. It's a little too late. We've People have paid into it, They've, we've promised it, mm -hmm. probably not gonna do away with it. So kind of the approach we take with our clients in our office is if you're over age 60, it's pretty much, I think, gonna be there as promised, yeah. right? You're too close, they can't really make changes. If you're over 55, mm -hmm. it's probably gonna be there in uh, the manner in which it's been promised. Mm -hmm. Now, age 50. Yeah, that was a little. Maybe, maybe mm -hmm. not. And if you're under 50, I think Social Security is gonna be there. Mm -hmm probably just not in the manner in which it's been promised, okay? Yeah. So the only way that we can fix the problem is either do a dramatic reduction in benefits, which we're probably not going to do, mm -hmm. or bring in more revenue. Mm -hmm. And I think that's probably the path that the government will go. Mm -hmm. uh, so if we have any young viewers and you're under age 50, you probably need to be socking away as much money as you possibly can mm -hmm. into re different retirement plans. Uh, if you're over age 50, certainly over age 55, it's probably going to be there. But even if the benefits are not reduced, mm -hmm. I think the amount of tax that you have to pay on those benefits mm -hmm. could, uh, could be increased. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that we recommend to our clients is to make sure that you have a pretty significant sum of money in tax-free investments or mm -hmm. tax-free options. Because if tax rates go up at some point in the future, uh, as long as you've got a good amount of money in kind of like a tax-free bucket, mm -hmm. It doesn't matter how high tax rates go, yeah. you know, tax-free is tax-free. Mm -hmm. And you need to make sure that you have plenty of money accumulated mm -hmm. to weather maybe some of these periods that we might see in the future where taxes could go much higher. Mm -hmm. So are there any other questions or concerns that the individuals that the two of you talk with have in regards to Social Security? I get a ton of questions mm -hmm. on Social Security. I mean, how do I file? How do I know which, which strategy is the right one? Because there's, mm -hmm. I think, before they changed the rule last May, there was 567 ways yeah. to file for Social yeah. Security with, two, with a couple. Right. So I'm sure the number's down a little bit, but probably 540 now. Right. How does, it, how does one know what the right way to go is? Well, mm -hmm. I, I think when, when individuals ask that question, mm -hmm. um, the only accurate response is to say, we, we, we don't know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We don't know. The only way of knowing exactly how you should file your Social Security is if you know exactly when you're going to pass away. Right. That's yep. the only way of knowing. So it's mm -hmm. kind of hindsight's 2020. I personally believe this is maybe a little different than a lot of advisors that are out there and what some of our viewers may be hearing, but I personally believe that it's difficult for an individual to make a mistake on how they file. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is, again, hindsight's gonna be 2020. You know, if, if we knew exactly what the future held, every decision we ever made would be perfect. Mm -hmm. But I think when it, comes, when it comes to Social Security, individuals don't really need to be scared mm -hmm. that they're gonna make some horrible mistake mm -hmm. and they're gonna cost themselves tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars. Uh, by choosing one option versus the other, that might be the case, but you won't know for many, 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 right. many years. So I think one of the things they could do is probably get an analysis done. Mm -hmm. We can mm -hmm. project some things based upon family history and how long someone thinks they might live. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a little bit of an educated guess. And we can do an analysis for them and figure out what would work best for them mm -hmm. if, if those assumptions are hit. But the one thing we know in life is normally those assumptions aren't hit. So yeah. you just kind of make your best uh, best guess, your best decision. Yeah. So if you do have questions about Social Security and you want more information, by all means, give us a call at the office. We can run the analysis, or if you just have other questions in general about Social Security and kind of what the future may hold or what tax-free options are available to you, please feel free to call the office and or you can visit the website for more information. And last, we also have a Social Security guide for anybody that wants to call us and request it. We'd be happy to drop that in the mail to you. So what ends up happening over time is you get to take advantage of the volatility in the market, meaning you don't like it when the stock market goes down. No, nobody likes to see that, but if you're actively contributing to the account, you're actually getting to take advantage of that a little bit. Let me explain the differences between active and dormant accounts. Basically what we're talking about here is this. If you have an account that you put money into on a monthly basis, maybe through your current employer or any other type of investment program, if you're putting money into it on a monthly basis, that's considered an active account because obviously you're actively contributing to it each and every month. Now the opposite of that would be a dormant account. And a dormant account is any account that you have that you do not put money into at least on a monthly basis, that's the key. So it could be a previous employer's retirement plan that you never rolled over, or maybe you did roll it over, but you're no longer contributing to it. 
those types of accounts are considered dormant. And what ends up happening more often than not is I see that advisors will basically treat active accounts and dormant accounts exactly the same. When in reality, you really shouldn't. You should have a different strategy for an account that you're adding money to on a monthly basis versus an account that you're not adding any, not adding any money to. And let me go over an example as to why. So if we take a look at the stock market over time, you know, if we basically simplify it a little bit, we know that the market goes up and goes down. So if you're actively contributing, if you're putting money into that account each and every year, what you do is you get to basically take advantage of what's called dollar cost averaging. And that means that you're putting money into, when, into the uh, market or into possibly the mutual fund if you have a 401k or a 403b, something of that nature. You're putting money into it when the market's low and then you, you're buying it when it's a little bit high, higher and then you're, you're maybe buying a little bit here, but that's okay because then as the market goes back down again, you're still putting money in when it's low. So what ends up happening over time is you get to take advantage of the volatility in the market, meaning you don't like it when the stock market goes down. No, nobody likes to see that. But if you're actively contributing to the account, you're actually getting to take advantage of that a little bit because you're taking advantage of the volatility, meaning you're buying more shares at a lower price when the market went down. And that will actually help you recover more quickly then when the market goes up. So in an actively funded account, again, maybe a 401k, 403b, any other type of investment program where you're putting money in monthly, having this type of volatility can be okay. And where we see this more often than not, obviously, is gonna be with mutual funds. Most 401k plans, 403b plans will be strictly invested in mutual funds, and that can be an okay time to use mutual funds. It's not necessarily bad because you're able to take advantage of the volatility. However, whenever you have the opportunity to roll those types of dollars, either in a 403b or a 401k over to an IRA, we usually recommend that you take that opportunity. And the reason why is because once we move into an IRA, typically uh, it's gonna become a dormant account, meaning you're no longer putting any money into it. And the IRA is gonna have some advantages. You basically have more options than what you used to have when you had the money uh, in your employer's plan. So mutual funds are still an option if you wanna contribute monthly to the IRA. More often than not, you're no longer going to put any additional contributions in the IRA. So now you have other things that you can invest in, uh, maybe exchange traded funds or annuities or maybe individual stocks or bonds, real estate investment trusts, re really almost anything that you can think of. You have more options. And what you can do with an IRA, since you're no longer contributing to it, is you can add safety nets to that money, meaning when we have a situation where the stock market starts to go down, again, you're not taking advantage of that volatility. So what you wanna do then is protect the principal. You wanna protect and preserve the principal that you have built up in the account. Because again, unlike when you were actively contributing, there's no advantage to you when the market uh, loses value. If you're fully invested, you're not able to take advantage of it. So what you wanna have is safety nets. One of the things we do at our firm is we use something that's called a stop loss. Not with every position or every investment that we use, but a stop loss is basically something that when things uh, surprise us in the market or in the economy and the market starts to react and go down, well, basically you, that position can be sold and just move to cash. And in particular, when it's inside of an IRA, that's a good, possibly a good strategy to follow because there's no tax consequences of doing that. Obviously, the IRA is just growing tax deferred. So if the position is sold, uh, you don't have to worry about uh, paying any additional taxes. So it's a strategy that works really nicely, and it's something that we definitely recommend individuals that are definitely within about 10 years of retirement going ahead and taking advantage of the options that you might have that would be a little better inside of an IRA than, say, just a regular mutual fund. So, again, when you have an active account, it's okay to use mutual funds. Once the account becomes dormant, you usually want to avoid things like mutual funds where you're just left to the mercy of the market, and you want to have some sort of an investment that is going to have a built-in safety feature, uh, or if not, then again, work with a firm like ourselves where we could possibly use a stop loss on it. Because what ends up happening is if you have a dormant account invested directly in the stock market, maybe with mutual funds, what will happen is as the market's volatile, you're not using that volatility to your advantage, and the fees and expenses that you have to pay end up kind of acting like an anchor over time. So this is an issue that's misunderstood by a lot of individuals, even a lot of financial advisors don't necessarily understand the differences between active and dormant accounts. So this is why my book on retirement planning, I spent an entire chapter covering this specific example in detail. So if you're basing your retirement income strategy or plan on dividend income, I think it's important to at least get your arms around exactly how much risk is actually there.
I want to talk a little bit today about dividend income. A lot of times people think that, that dividends are, are relatively safe and, and they can be a, a great part of your portfolio, but I wouldn't base your, your whole income plan off of, off of dividend producing uh, positions. I've got for an example here, Bank of America. And back in 2007, a lot of people were holding Bank of America stocks in their portfolio. And I've got the numbers here. I'm going to be looking back and forth just to make sure that I, that I gave you the right number. And I've got an example of a, of a gentleman that was receiving $28,992 a year off of a $500,000 portfolio in dividend income. This is 64 cents a share is what he was receiving and his share price was $44.17. So this equates to a 5.8% dividend. Very nice dividend paying position. I, I would use that right now if it were available. Now, let's fast forward. So that was back in September of 2007. Let's fast forward a year and a half later. So now we've went through the 2008 correction and we're in March of 2009. So now his $500,000 portfolio is worth $43,148. So the share price has went down from $44.17 to now it's at $3.81 a share. He's receiving a 1% dividend, I'm sorry, 1.05% dividend, which is one cent per share. He's receiving $453 per year in dividend income. So remember, back in 07, it was 28,992. That number has fallen now to $453 a year. Let's fast forward to today, because I'm sure a lot of you are thinking, well, that was back in, in 07 or 08. Now, now everything's back to normal. Well, you're right in thinking that after a correction, it usually takes about seven years just to get back to even. However, this particular position, if we look at it, depending on the day you look at it, right now, it's $15.70 per share. It's paying a five cent dividend, which means your total portfolio value would be $177,803 now. So remember back in 2007, we were at 500,000. Now it's worth 177,803. That's producing $2,265 per year in income. So Oh, basically 10% of where it was back in 07. So if you're basing your retirement income strategy or plan on dividend income, I think it's important to at least get your arms around exactly how much risk is actually there. So I think a lot of people are, are just on, on autopilot or on cruise control and they're not really thinking about that type of, of scenario happening again. But I would make sure that your portfolio is completely protected or as much as possible so that if something like this were to happen again, it doesn't affect your lifestyle. If you have any questions about how much risk you actually have in your portfolio, and just to make sure that it matches up with how much risk you're comfortable with, please feel free to call our office and or visit our website. So I want to talk today about a couple of really cool pieces of technology that we see that are out there and then also talk a little bit about some strategies that you can look towards and try to find that can really help you get on a good path to being able to capitalize on some of this um, incredible uh, technological growth. Welcome to this week's segment of Strategic Wealth University. I'm Jordan and today I want to talk with you about something that might be a little different than what you're traditionally used to hearing. Uh, oftentimes, I know me especially, whenever I'm watching the news, I sometimes can see all the doom and gloom. I can see the negativity and the lack of optimism. And truth be told, society is more prosperous and less corrupt and, less, and there's less violence than the history of civilization. So what I want to do today is I want to tell you first and foremost, if you're watching all this negative news, Try to turn it off. Um, there's a lot of positivity out there and there's a lot of wonderful things that are going on right now in the world and especially in the economy. And today I wanna to talk about how you can find ways to capitalize on the future of society. Because we're looking right now at one of the biggest industrial revolutions we've ever seen in the history of civilization. And that's gonna come through technology and automation. And while to some that could be scary, it is the best opportunity to get involved in in the history of civilization. 
So I want to talk today about a couple of really cool pieces of technology that we see that are out there and then also talk a little bit about some strategies that you can look towards and try to find that can really help you get on a good path to being able to capitalize on some of this um, incredible uh, technological growth. Now one of the first really cool things that we see is what's known as 3D printing. Uh, it sounds a little crazy. 3D printing is basically exactly what I just described to you. It prints 3D images. As an example, uh, I was reading an article probably about two weeks ago, and um, they actually now are printing the front dashboard of a Toyota Corolla. I thought that was really cool. In China, they actually can print entire houses. And I think as we move into the future, 3D printing technology is going to be what we like to call an exponential growth industry. There's rapid growth and there's rapid opportunity. Uh, that's one really exciting area. Another really exciting area of growth and technological advancement is going to be the implementation of artificial intelligence. Uh, I know I saw a little while ago a uh, tax commercial talking about people who are filing their taxes and they actually have what's called the IBM Watson. It's a form of artificial intelligence that can actually give you um, as much information as you need on helping you fill, finish and um, work on your taxes. That's a really cool piece of uh, technology is gonna be the artificial intelligence. Now one of the other things I wanna talk with you about, maybe the third, uh, kind of the big technological growers is gonna be the use of robotics. Uh, robotics is going to be the future of everything. Um, it's going to be really helpful for a lot of individuals, especially in the healthcare industry. Uh, there's a company out there that uh, has these micro um, robots that can actually go into the body and can cut out and kill cancers to where you know, a surgeon's hand might not be able to. Uh, when I was reading that, I thought that was incredible. Uh, so what we want to do and what I want to talk with you all about is how do we capitalize on that? Um, it's wonderful to see all the positivity, but then the question is, hey, you know, I'm in, the, um, I'm in a capitalistic society. I want to have an opportunity to take advantage of some of this growth. So a couple of different ways to do that is to look for these um, exponential growers is what we call them. Uh, another way to do it is to find someone who can help you with it. Uh, I know as a firm, we have uh, quite a bit of different uh, resources and quite a bit of different portfolios that give us the ability to capitalize on these exponential growers and exponential companies. Uh, one portfolio uh, that has some exponential growers, um, we really think is going to have uh, a ton of upside. Again, with all of this increased technology and with really this industrial revolution that we're in the middle of, uh, I think that while obviously we see you know, the negativity in the media oftentimes, there's so much positivity and there's so much good. And the question is, how do we find a way to maximize some of that positivity and some of that good? Uh, if you'd like more information about how you can look at different exponential companies, different exponential stocks, and put yourself in an awesome position to get some growth in the market, give us a call or check us out on the website. Thank you.